Thanks for joining us today on Apostolic Pentecostal Channel. We are here to provide new and classic sermons weekly. We have tried to remaster and restore these sermons. Thanks for joining us. Please like, comment, and subscribe. May Yahweh's blessings be with you. So I trust the Lord to help us here this afternoon. I'm having a few changes with my eyes. My eyes, I'm always different. My eyes are going in reverse. They were really not that good, and now they're getting better. And the doctor tells me that sometimes it maybe it's a cataract or something in there that's causing the lens to change. But I can see you a whole lot better. I used to couldn't see very good out there. You're, you're blurry. Now you're clear. Now I see better with my glasses. I can still need them for this. Not quite there yet. I can see pretty good. It just depends on how big the font is. Amen. Amen. In fact, it's so good I again forgot to put there it is. Thank you for the book of Proverbs. I'm going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, verse 27 through 34. Through wisdom is a house builded, and by
by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. I'm dropping down to verse 27. Prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. I went by the field to slothful, by the vineyard of the man that was void of understanding, and the load was grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down, and I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. We had a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth for thy want as an armed man. I want to talk about just maybe three principles of life that I feel are important. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be together with your great people. Enable me, Lord, to say something that will build the faith of men and women that are in this church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise and thank you. Amen. Let's talk about the three principles of life. You know, Solomon was the son of David and was considered to be one of the wisest men that ever lived. Matter of fact, sometimes if you don't have a lot of time to read the Bible, if you just flip over Proverbs and grab a verse, you'll find that uh, that one verse a lot of times has a lot of meat on it and give you a reason to spend some time in thought consideration because if Solomon said something, it usually carried a lot of weight and a lot of meaning to it. And uh, the scripture tells us the Lord gave him an opportunity uh, to have anything that he would have wanted. And the Lord told Solomon, he said, what would you like to have? And Solomon said, this is the one thing I want more than anything else. He said, I want wisdom to know how to come in and go out before your people. That was an expression they used at that time, simply to be able to conduct myself in such a way as a leader uh, that I evoke a sense of confidence, you know, and direction. And so the Lord said, well, because you did not ask for riches and wealth, he said, I'm going to give you the wisdom, but I'm also going to give you the riches, and I'm going to give you wealth like no one has ever had before you. And it did happen just as the Lord said. I think some of you remember the story of the Queen of Sheba. And uh, when she came, the Queen of the South came to see the blessings of God in uh, Solomon's life. She was impressed by all the gold, the silver, the ornate uh, structure of everything that was built. But you know, the thing that was so interesting was it said when she saw his ascent into the house of the Lord, as he made his ascent into the house of the Lord with all his servants, the scripture said she just, she just lost her breath. <laughs> it was just uh, captivating to her to see the ascent into the house of God. It was the worship that really, really impressed her more than anything else. The way that Solomon approached God in the temple, that made quite an, an impact upon her. And uh, so Solomon was a man that to God had gifted with wisdom. And uh, he mentioned these things relative to uh, the house, the home. And I wanted to more or less stick with that particular thing because he mentions it uh, several times in this particular chapter. And this is the analogy that he uses. And he says, through wisdom, he said, a house is built. And by understanding, it is established. And then he goes on to say, by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. You know, I found that uh, in life that you can learn something from everyone. You don't necessarily have to be in the company of someone that has a lot of professional training or professional uh, acclamations, uh, degrees, and achievements. So those things are nice, and uh, you'll benefit from it. But uh, there's a lot to be learned sometimes in life just through experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge. And the writer here refers to it in a measure here when he talks about the chambers being filled. Amen. The house being built and the being established. Uh, there's some things that we learn through trial and error. There's some things we learn that work. There's some things we learn that don't work. And, uh, you know, the younger I was, the more answers I had. I'm sort of, my father told me one time, he said, son, you realize that in life, the older you get, the more answers you have, but nobody wants to ask the questions. You just walk around wanting somebody to 
They used to ask you something, but he said, after you get that age, they just ignore you. He said, when you're young, you know, you've got all, you think you have the answers, but you don't have near as much wisdom as you think you have. Solomon was a wise man. When I drop down to verse 27, he talks about prepare thy work without. Prepare thy work without. And he's talking about the field. Uh, many times, uh, you know, in growing up, when I uh, was a little boy, uh, some uh, 60 years ago, 60 plus years, a little 50 something years ago, uh, it was not uncommon to go to some rural areas in the state, and when you went to a house, a house always had a garden. Anybody remember those times? Uh, you'd go to people's houses, they always had a garden behind it. My, uh, my grandfather, my mother's uh, dad, uh, one of the things he did in the springtime is he had a wagon, and he had a plow, and he had a mule, and uh, he would ride that, drive that wagon into town with that mule and that plow in the back. He'd pull up to people's houses, and he would plow their spring gardens. And they would pay him to plow their spring gardens. And he would take the plow out of the back, unhitch the mule, hit, hitch, hit, uh, hook it up to the plow in the back of the yard, and he'd plow up the garden, and then he'd do just in reverse, take the mule back, put it on the wagon, put the plow in the back of the wagon, and he'd start home. He did that all through the summer, putting gardens in everywhere. In those days, people had a garden. They just didn't depend upon going to the grocery store. In fact, uh, if you lived out in the country at all, then you knew the importance of having a garden. And uh, Solomon is using this particular analogy to give us a picture of what it means to build a life. To build a life. And he said, one of the first things you want to do, he said, is you want to prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field. I know everybody loves to see the house. Everybody wants to see the structure, the mark of success. Many times people's success is determined by the particular place they live or what they live in. But Solomon said it would be well worth your while before you start really laying brick that you start breaking up ground. Because it's important what goes in you rather than just what people see on the outside of you. The house represents something that people see. But what is happening in the field represents what is invested in your life. What is invested in your life. I, uh, I count myself blessed this afternoon to have had a uh, faithful father, uh, a dad that uh, went to work every day, a dad that got up in the morning. Uh, he didn't lay around. Amen. He didn't wait on somebody else to do his work. He got up even as a young man. And he'd go to work, and then I knew at around 4.30 or 5 o'clock, I would see my dad's car pull in uh, to the driveway, and he would come home from work, tired in body, with his lunch kit. All of us kids would run out there and hang on his waistband, pull on his arms, you know, I'm sure he enjoyed that. Fighting kids to the front living room, just looking for a chair to sit down in. I'm glad I had a mother, I had a mother that always saw to it that a meal was prepared. Uh, when my dad got home, there was a meal on the table for my dad and for us kids, and we all ate together. And we were taught to pray before we ate our meals. And uh, we didn't eat a meal until there was a word of prayer. And that, that was part of my life. And we were taught to sit around the table and to show respect. And especially show respect to uh, my mother. Uh, dad did not allow any of us kids to uh, talk back to mother or to treat her with anything less than respect. And there, that was something that was just, there was no compromise in those areas. And uh, that was the, the home I was raised in. To say it was perfect, I can't tell you it was perfect. But to me, I thought it was just the way everybody lived. I thought everybody lived that way. I, I didn't know that there were homes where dads somehow, sometimes left and you didn't know where they went. I didn't know there were homes where sometimes dads, you know, abused their kids beat on them and mistreated them. I remember someone I know quite well. Uh, he's an individual that we spent a lot of time with in my past. And he said, you know, he said, one of the most heartbreaking things in my life was, he said, they called me by my first name. He said, Mike was, uh, my dad left me and he left my mother. And he said, I remember, he said, I found out that he had married a lady and that had taken, who had a son. And he said, they lived on a neighboring block 
just a block over from where I live. And he said, my dad would come in there and he said, that little boy had a bicycle. He said, I didn't have a bicycle, but he said, I would go out and stand in the street and watch through the window while my dad was there at another house. And he said, uh, I'll never forget it as a little boy. He said, it stuck with me all my life. You know, it stuck with me all my life. It's not really so such a big thing about the house as it is what happens in the field. Because the field is what actually determines whether or not there is going to be the type of character and the type of living in the house that really makes it worthwhile. He said, whatever you do, he said, I know you want to get the house built. You want people to look at you and say, you're the picture of success. But he said, I'm going to tell you where it all starts. He said, it all starts in the field. He said, before you build the house, he said, build something called a garden. Go out there and till the soil and plant some seed and get some things growing there that will put strength in your body. I think of the words of Jesus Christ one time. He said, it is my will that you should bear fruit, he said, and, and that your fruit should remain. We're told many times in Scripture that uh, the type of character that we are to uh, express and to uh, demonstrate to the world, amen, is likened unto fruit. Matter of fact, one writer called it the very fruit of the Spirit. That's something that happens in the field. That's something that happens in the field. So the wise man said, he said, don't just put all your attention in building something that will gain the accolades of men and cause them to praise you and say, man, you, you're great. You, you, really, you really got it together. Because time will tell. Time will tell. Because, he said, the existence and the life of that, the longevity of that house will never, never outlast what you did in the field. What you did in the field. It's in the field where character is developed. It's in the field where the virtues of life, like Brother Norvell was talking about a while ago, the strength, the power. Amen. That's where it all starts is in the field. I, I remember one of the most exciting things in my life at the age of five was my grandmother made me a cotton sack. Does anybody know what a cotton sack is? I don't mean a sack made out of cotton. Though it was probably made out of cotton. It was, I believe, it was called medigold. It still had the, it had the print <laughs> on the side of it. It was a 50-pound flower sack. And uh, I was only about this tall. And uh, the older folks were getting to go to the cotton patch, and I thought that was the most exciting thing to do was to get to go to the cotton patch. <laughs> and uh, my, my grandmother uh, made me a cotton sack out of a flour sack and put a strap on it. I had that flour sack for a good while. I remember one time Dad went to the cotton field, and I went with him, and, and a man, uh, he said, my son wants to, we were actually... Uh, not picking cotton, we were pulling bowls, and, uh, and they told me, I was just a young kid, they said, son, get everything that's got cotton in it. And so I went down the road, and if there's any white at all showing, Brother Jerry, it came off. It might have been a total green, except for right in the center. There was some cotton peeking out, peeking out. And I was grabbing the green bowls, and I stood in that cotton sack up with cotton and green bowls, and you know, I got down there to where they, they weighed in. You know, they had a big old high tray with high sides on it. They had this little weight thing hanging out there. You hung your cotton sacks on. And boy, I was so excited. I couldn't wait till they hung out on there. And it said 50 pounds. I was going to make 50 cents. <laughs> I did. I made 50 cents. And, and uh, But when they turned my cotton sack upside down, I started pouring it in the trailer. The man that was over the whole thing, you know, he's standing there watching the cotton being poured out and there in the field where we were working. And uh, a lot of mine was green. It really was. And, and I could tell by the way some of those guys were talking that that was not a good thing. One said, oh my, look at all those green bows. And I'll never forget that older gentleman. He was standing there, you know, had his pipe in his mouth. And they said, what are you going to do, Mr. So-and-so? I mean, Mr. Weaver. He said, uh, we're going to pay that boy. He worked hard, he said. <laughs> Learning and developing happens in the field. That's where it happens, right out there. I, uh, I didn't really think about that much then. Later as I've gotten older, I realized what that old man did. 
That old man created something in me that I needed as a young boy to feel like there was a sense of accomplishment and that I had accomplished something. It cost him. It really did. It cost him because he had to get somebody in there to get those great bows out of that trailer. But he invested in me. He had invested in me. Amen. I want to tell you this. A home will not last any longer than the investments that you make in the field. The investments that you make in the field. The home is the covering. The home is a covering. It is. And thank God for the covering that God allows us to enjoy through his blessings. But thank God for the people that are willing to invest in us. People that are willing, amen, to invest in us as we work our way through life. Amen. He said, prepare the field. In other words, he said, it's what happens in the field that's really going to determine the longevity of a home. The longevity of a home. Our home was a place that was open not just to our family, but it was open to others. Amen. And my mom and dad and my kin folks, and not only our home, but I remember times in our lives when our home, for whatever reason, we didn't have a home at that time, and, and our cousins would open up their homes, Sister Hughes, and, and they'd invite us in, and they'd say, well, until you get a job. Well, I want to tell you what, we didn't get in that home because somehow or another we deserved it. We got in that home because of a character development and because of some spiritual virtues and attributes that were developed in the lives of men and women amen, that caused them to be compassionate and thoughtful for those that were less fortunate. Amen, amen. And we were able to enjoy that home, but what was more important is what had happened in the field of life, in the field of life. You go to the home and it's a retreat, it's a highway. But it's what happens in the field that makes you who you are and what you are. Once you leave the driveway and you get out on the highways, you're going through the byways, and you're encountering all kinds of things at a very fast changing, uh, at a bad, very fast changing pace. And things are fluid and they're moving in every direction. And, and you have the opportunity, you've got to make decisions sometimes in a split second. And amen, and it's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference in who you are and a difference in who somebody else is. It's all going to be determined because of what happened in the field. Amen, what happens in the field. Amen. My dad, I remember him uh, coming home uh, one time from General Motors. And dad worked in the lead department where they put hot lead on the back part of a, uh, the header panel, they called it there on the, at, the, at the roof of the car. And they would put hot molten lead, and then dad would take a grinder and as the car came down the, uh, the uh, conveyor belt, Dad would pull a grinder down out of the ceiling and he wore a hood like a spaceman. He wore these old big hoods and he had an air hose going to it. I, I got to walk through General Motors plant one time and I saw what they were doing. And he'd take those big grinders and they would polish off the corners and he'd make it look as smooth as possible as the car would move along. He'd work on it. And then it would go on down for another, uh, for it to be attended to in a different way. But one day, Dad reached up and got that grinder, and I'm telling you, friend, somebody hung on something, and it spun loose, and I mean, it hit him, I don't know if it hit him, but it hit him pretty hard. Matter of fact, he had some injuries because of it. And I remember seeing Dad coming home, and my heart was, you know, I was touched as a kid. And I thought, that's my dad. He's out there working hard, working for me. And uh, just because he got hurt, he's not going to stop. No, he was back on the job and just a little while, working again. Stitches sewed up or whatever they did to him. He was back working again. Amen. I, I measured my dad, not because of the way he sat in the recliner, not necessarily because of the way that dad slept in his bed or ate his meal. The thing that really made dad, dad to me was the way that he worked on the field. Amen. Amen. He prepared some things. He went through some things. He demonstrated life. Amen. Outside the door of our homes. And and that, that challenged me as a young boy. Amen. That challenged me as a young person. Solomon, the, the, uh, the wise man of the Bible, Solomon, makes this statement. He said, I want you to know this. He said, by knowledge the chambers are filled with pressure and pleasant riches. But he said, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field. And afterwards he said, build uh, thy house. Build thy house. As you go down through here in this reading, the writer goes on in great detail to let us know that everything didn't work out in the house. 
of the man that he was observing and, and giving this lesson. He said, I walked by this man's house. I walked by his field. And he said the walls were all broken down around his garden. And he said there was nettles and there were thorns that had grown over whatever possible fruit might have grown there. He said it was now covered with thorns and it was covered, he said, uh, with nettles. And he said when I saw all of that, he said I, I came to a conclusion. I came to a conclusion. He said that a little sleep, a little slumber, he said, and uh, a little folding of the hands. I don't suppose he had any need to go to the house. He could tell by looking in the field that more than likely there wasn't anybody living in the house. Because if the field is not being taken care of, if the field is not really as it should be, then there's probably no one in the house. Because you can't live in the house without the field producing something worthwhile. He said, and I came to this conclusion Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth. And as an armed man, in other words, you're going to be desperate. You're going to be hungry. You're going to be starving if you don't take care of that which pertains to the field. To the field. When I uh, started into the ministry back in 1971, uh, you know, I admired preachers and still do. And I understand ministry a whole lot more today than I did then. But something got a hold of my heart. That's the reason I wound up being in the ministry. I felt a burden. I guess they still get those things today. I hope they do. I hope it's not just, well, I want to go to college. Should I be a lawyer? Should I be a pilot? Should I be a... I think I'll just be a preacher. Uh, you know, and, and sad to say, I think there's a lot of them that make that determination. And I really do. I'm worried that there's some that just sort of, you know, heads, I'm a doctor, tails, I'm a preacher. And uh, they flip the coin, so to speak. But uh, God got a hold of my heart. He really did. He began to deal with me about it. And, and when I first went into the ministry, of course, I was learning. I didn't know anything much about it other than I had a father law, thank God, that had worked in the field a long time and gave me a lot of good instructions. I remember many times going to the hospital and visitation with him, and he taught me some things about visitation. One of the things I'll never forget is kind of humorous. He said, son, when you walk in the room to visit somebody in the hospital and pray for them, remember this one thing. He said, they may have just decided they wanted to go to the bathroom before you walked in. He said, and it's very inconvenient for a lady to get up and go to the restroom while you're there, or sometimes a man. And he said, so make your visit. He said, make it good. Minister to them. But he said, you know, get in there and get out. <laughs> he told me one time, he said, I was in the hospital once and was so miserable. He said, I was laying there thinking, oh God, I need to go to the restroom. He said, and a preacher walked in. And decided he wanted to share several messages and, you know, everything else he'd been through in life. He said, I laid there and smiled the best I could. But he said, I had my mind on going to the bathroom so bad. I was so glad when he walked out of there. Well, that's not a lesson, I guess, that some of you think was that valuable unless you're the one laying in the bed. And I walk in the room. And then you're going to be glad that my father-in-law shared those works in the field with me. Amen. Amen. So when I visit somebody in the hospital, I want to go in there and pray for them, minister to them, but I don't want to build three tabernacles. <laughs> Get in, minister, pray for them. Amen. And, <clears throat> and move right along. Thank the Lord. But he helped me in a lot of ways. But I remember as a young boy growing up, I used to think, Brother Norvell, boy, if I could ever drive one of them Buick, you know, 98s, electrics. Wow. That was long. It seemed like I'm here to that media booth. You know, they had seats in them that were like couches in a living room. You just sort of sat in them. You'd lean them back, put your cassette in that player, just air conditioning blowing in your face. Oh, man. Then I want to get that Thompson chain Bible. And I want some of those Stacey Adams shoes with the patent leather tips on them. And a vest, you know, with my hanky hanging out. And just, you know, I mean, look the part. And it's amazing how people can get enamored about such superficial things. 
But it was in the field that I learned that really none of those things count. It was in the field that I, that I learned that none of that stuff really matters a whole lot. It wasn't in the house. It wasn't in there where everything just sort of laid back and you feel the safety and the security of everything and a lot of people cover for you. It was out there in the field where you're facing the cold wind of opposition. Criticism is coming from every side. And God sees to it that you get enough of it to keep you on. You learn what's going on really in life when you're working out there. Praise God. Thank God for the church. And thank God for the people that God gives us and allows us to interact with. And I thank God for the church. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of my growing up took place somewhere beside behind this pulpit. Amen. It took place out there in the field. Amen. I know I've told you this before. I'll be brief here, but I'm running out of time already. But I remember the first time I ever ran into the devil. And literally ran into the devil. I was sitting in a Ramada Inn in Arlington, Texas back in 19 and, uh, about 1973. I'd only been in ministry about a year with license. And someone had asked me to go to a place and set up a banquet for some preachers. And I walked in and sat down. And a man came across the foyer out of the, uh, where the bar area was at the Ramada Inn. They had the bar off to one side of the restaurant. I was sitting in the lobby and he came across there and he pointed his finger at me. I mean, he just walked up to me, right there, he walked up to me and put his finger on my nose. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. He said, my name is Gilliman. I didn't know what Gilliman meant at the time. I later looked it up and realized it meant I am the poisonous head. And he said, I will destroy you. Now, if you don't think that will shake you up, you know, I'm at the ripe age of about 21. <laughs> you know, and here's this older gentleman. I mean, he's got a gold-studded watch on. He's got a real nice, you know, Cashmere jacket, nice loafers on. He's dressed to the teeth. Don't think his eyes are just red as fire. He didn't even have pupils. He just opened his eyes. They like they were just, you know, inflamed. And he looked at me and he said, my name is Gilead. He said, I'm going to destroy you. And I remember getting up after he walked away from my pupil. He walked about this, not my pupil, the chair where I was sitting. There was drapes hanging against the glass there. And uh, he walked about this far, pushed the glass door open, stepped out on the sidewalk. I got up behind him as the door was closing. I thought, I need to see where this guy's going. Who is this guy? And when I pushed open the door, he was gone. I turned to the lady at the desk. I said, do you know that guy? She said, I've never seen him before in my life. It was after that the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you know, he said, I allow that person to walk into your life that you would realize that you're now in the arena of life. You're not the young man that's sitting under the coattail of a preacher but now you are in the arena and the opposition knows who you are. The opposition knows who you are. I remember going through town and I saw that word G-I-L-A on the sign and it prompted, my, it prompted me to go look it up and that's where I found out it meant the poisonous death. Amen. You've got to be prepared but your preparation is going to happen in the field. Your preparation is going to take place out there. Thank God for the glory, for the worship, for the interaction that we have among one another here in this church. We support one another. We pray for one another. Amen. But our growing is going to take place out there. He said, prepare the field first. Amen. In other words, go out there. Get, get your bumps and get your scrapes and get your cuts. It's going to happen, folks. Amen. Because we're Christians, we cannot expect everything just to go along easy. Everything just to fall in our lap. Amen. We're going to find out that it's in the field that we actually learn what it is to grow up and to live for God. The writer says this. He said, I walked by a man's house. And he said, I came to a conclusion. Somewhere along in his life, he slept and he slumbered. And then he folded his hands to sleep some more. What's actually the writer saying here is the cycle. Sleep, slumber, folding hands to sleep. Now, if you don't know what that is, wait till you get about my age, and it happens. <laughs> you get in a chair, you go to sleep, you're half awake, and you're slumbering. And then you fold your hands over your chest, and you sleep some more. He, he said they slept, they slumbered, and they folded their hands to sleep again. It's a vicious cycle. Amen. And in a spiritual sense, it can be a downward spiral. A downward spiral. 
Amen. A downward spiral. I think of the words of the psalmist David in Psalms 13 and 3. He said, Consider and hear me, O my Lord God. He said, Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. David was saying, Lord, help to open my eyes and wake me from the sleep that will lead me to defeat. Wake me from the sleep that will lead me to defeat. I remember one time I was driving back from, from Houston. I'd been doing some services uh, for She's the Christ services down in Beaumont, Orange. And I was coming back up through Lufkin one night. And uh, man, you know it's tough when you're going to sleep and driving. And you turn the radio up wide open. Then you hang, roll the window down. Then you hang your head out the window. And then you bite your tongue, and then you bite your hand. I'm going to tell you something. That old body's going to win out. I don't care how determined you are. Even that slumber gets a hold of you. And I'll never forget, I was driving Sister Miller's car. At that time, she was Sister Harper. And she had a Supra, Toyota Supra, a little sports rig. And I was driving it, using it, driving back at the Glenmore. Some of you know where the old Dixie Inn is in town? It's right over here. When you're coming into the late morning, there's a little old hotel there. I think it's called Dixie Inn. It may seem like it was. It's right there at the Y, right there at the V. I mean, when you're coming into town, you've either got to go left or right. You don't go down the middle. But that night, somebody was sitting there. I'll never forget that guy. He was sitting behind the window, looking out that window. And when I woke up, I was headed right to that patch of grass. It looked like his eyes were that big. He jumped out from that window, and I don't know where he went, but he went in the floor somewhere. I grabbed the wheel of that car, and I swung to the left. Those tires screeched, and I just missed that building, and thank God. Isn't it amazing how that wakes you up? <laughs> David said, Lord, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Amen. Sometimes God's got to drop something on us. Wake us up. Get us, you know, have you ever tried to talk to a drunk? <laughs> or somebody under the influence of, of narcotics or something? I know Brother, <laughs> brother Doc is over there. He's mine just a week. Yeah, he, he's going through files right now. Trying to find the worst case scenario. <laughs> Amen. But some, my father told 20 years ago, the only way you can stand a drunk is to get drunk with him. <laughs> well, I don't drink it's always unnerved me to be around somebody because when they're drunk and they're just a little three sheets in the wind, a lot of times they don't even know they're drunk. And, and you'll tell them, don't get in there, don't drive. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, they'll, in fact, they may just like it. Don't get in my way. I know what I'm doing. No, 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 you're not yourself. Yes, I am myself. No, 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 no. That would be a bad thing for you to get under that wheel. Amen. But in their mind, they're okay. In their mind, they're okay. And David is saying, Lord, wake me up. God, bring me to my senses. You're like the prodigal son sitting in a swine pen. And all of a sudden, there, the Bible said, and he finally came to himself. The light came on. And he said, my God, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Every now and then, there's those times when God allows something to happen in our life that kind of brings us around. Brings us around. Helps us to come to ourselves and realize the most important thing in our lives is not what people see, it's what people don't see. It's what goes in us. It's what comes out of the field. It's the things that feed us. It's the principles that make us who we are. Those are the most important things. Anybody can put on a smile, put on a suit, drive a nice car, give anyone the idea that they're the picture of success, and people don't know really what's going on down in here. That's the reason David said, Lord, open my eyes. Help me see myself. Someone just referred to something a while ago. Sister Tamisha said it, and I thought while she was talking, it went to my mind, a thought that I had. She said, I, 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 I'm growing. And she implied, I hope others can tell that I'm growing. Sister Stalkup said, I'm growing. 
Amen. I, uh, well, Sister Five asked me how many pages was in this thing before I came out here. She thought I'd run all the paper out of the copier. And I said, it did quit running, but it wasn't because I had too many pages. But, <coughs> amen. I almost got off my thought there. But I thought it was listening to Sister Tamisha, and uh, she said, I hope others can see I'm maturing, I'm growing, and I can see it in myself. That happens in the field. Now she's got a life that she's building for Jesus Christ, and it's got security and it's covering. But what really makes Sister Tamisha Tamisha is what she's taking in and what's happening on the inside. It's what she's getting out of the field. It's what she's harvesting from personal experiences and she's applying it to her lives according to biblical principles and ironing out all those issues according to the truth that she understands and it's a beautiful thing. You need a different perspective every now and then. You really do. Any of you ladies like just a mirror that gives you a one dimension? All you can see is your face. You ever go to a motel and try to get dressed and you don't take a hand mirror? I guess I'm weird. I just I love y'all look at me like when I, when I put mirrors in my house, in the bathroom, I got mirrors that you look in here and then you can fold the sides. Ah, that's better. Because if I just take care of this, this hole back here is probably going to show. But if I've got a different 360 perspective, I'll take that comb and I'll, uh-huh, not on my watch. I'll paste that light over there and put that in. <laughs> Amen. Paste it right on down. You ladies laugh at me. I know what y'all do. You like more than, well, you know, because if you ask her, how do I look? Oh, you look good. Where's the car keys? But there's a certain sense of security you have when you're able to look at yourself or see yourself from different perspectives. Amen. Different perspectives. You know, the Bible talks about the word of the Lord. He said it's like looking into a mirror. It's like looking into a glass that's full of smoke, which actually creates a mirror effect. Now we see through a glass dark. He said, then face to face, but right now we see through a glass darkly. Amen. We're developing. We're learning. Amen. We're trying. A lot of times it's trial and error, but we're growing in Jesus Christ. Amen. And every now and then I need to flip a side mirror out. I'll say, Brother Withers, what do you think about that? And he'll say, Brother McGuire, I know what you're thinking, but I saw it from a different angle. And I'll be hopeful to say, Brother Withers, thank you for that. I would have never seen that if you hadn't told me. Amen. I would love for people to say, Brother Warren, I'll tell you what. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but sometimes you're a little curt. <laughs> I don't think, no, he's never said that. And I know Mary Cummins would never say that. It's called knocking on wood. <laughs> Amen. But people that love you and care about you will tell you the truth. I said they'll tell you the truth. Because when you go outside that door and you're in the field, they want you to be someone that succeeds and is never taken down by the spirit of slumber which causes us to sleep and to slumber and to fold our hands, amen, and get caught in the vicious downward cycle of getting away from God and the teachings that have been invested in us. Thank God for people that will wake us up. I said, thank God for people that will wake us up. Amen. I'm closing. Come on, musicians. But I'll tell you one thing. 
My mother-in-law was one of the best alarm clocks when it come to waking you up. <laughs> Amen. She might, and she loved you, but she didn't mind telling you if she didn't agree with you. She just laid it out. And sometimes I'm sure it was, it was for my good. Sometimes it sort of, you know, bothered me. But I got through it. God helped me. But you know, that all took place out there. You never saw that. It never happened in here. Thank God for the field. So the writer said, hey, hope you have a big house. Hope you have a nice house. Build you a beautiful home. Let people drive by and say how great it is. But only you know the real you is the person that was developed out there. what happened to you out there in the field. That's really who we are. This is not really us a lot of the time we come in here. This is us on our best behavior. <laughs> well, I better stop there. I'm doing pretty good. I need all the help I can get. I want to go to heaven. I said I want to go to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Let's stand and sing a little song here. I love the Lord.
And she said they began to share with us they had just lost their daughter. And she said, you know, we got to talking. And he said, you know, we've got a, an old cassette that we play every now and then. And he said, when we lost our daughter, we put it in the car and a song came up. And he said, it lifted our spirits. And she said, well, what was that song? He said it was entitled Never Alone. He said, have you ever heard that song? She said, yes, sir, I have. He said, how do you know that? She said, my pastor wrote that song. And something touched my heart. And I thought, God, what great riches could you have? And to know that somehow on that night when you gave me that song, you was giving it to me to give to a woman and man that was going to drive down on the darkest roads of their life. And you're going to remind them they're never alone. The things I rejoice over in here are wonderful, but I'll tell you, folks, there's a whole lot more that's happened out there in the field. I know the Lord has kept his hand on me. I know the Lord, could you give him some thanks for that, has kept his hand on me.